Hello everyone, I'm Ranger Jim. And I'm Ranger Jared, and I'd like to welcome you to a haunted evening at Hartwell Tavern. Tonight we'll be exploring over 300 years of New England ghost stories covering the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Stories involving ghosts and supernatural beings are as old as literature itself. They appear in the Epic of Gilgamesh in 2000 BCE. They appear in Homer's Odyssey. They even appear in the Bible, and they've been used in thousands of stories over thousands of years. Sometimes these stories served as a warning against the powers of Satan and the torments of purgatory. Other times they are for pure entertainment purposes, as in the writings of William Shakespeare. Stories of the supernatural are common to nearly every culture throughout the world, and they strike at a very primal human fear. Fear of the unknown and fear of the unquiet dead. And the people of colonial New England were no exception. In 17th century New England, belief in the supernatural was often influenced by the Protestant belief of the settlers that came here. Unlike the Catholics of Europe, who believed in a place called Purgatory, where a soul could be trapped between heaven and hell to atone for its sins, the Puritans instead believed that when a person died, their soul either went directly to heaven or to hell. Therefore, a ghost on the material plane was a direct conjuring of the devil himself, often working through human agents. In the beginning of the late war between forces loyal to Parliament and those of the late King Charles, a gentleman of that county, being oppressed by the King's party, took arms under the Earl of Essex and by his valor obtained the command of a lieutenant colonel. But as soon as the heat of war was abated, his ease and preferment led him to a careless and sensual life, insomuch as the godly commanders judged him unfit to continue in England, and thereupon sent him to Ireland, where he grew so vain and notional that he was cashiered from the army. Being then at liberty to sin without restraint, he became an absolute atheist, denying heaven or hell, God or devil, so that at last he became hateful. December of 1655, when Colonel Bowen was away, his wife, a gracious, understanding woman, not easily affrighted, being in bed, was startled to see one in the likeness of her husband, and just in his posture. The figure presented himself to her bedside, Proffering to come to bed to her, which she refusing, he gave this answer, What? Do you refuse the husband of thy bosom? And after some time, she alleging Christ her husband, it disappeared. Strange, miserable howlings and cries were then heard about the house. His tread, his posture, sighing, humming, were frequently heard in the parlor. In the daytime, often the shadow of one walking would appear on the wall. One night was very remarkable. As she was going to bed, she perceived by the impression on the bed as if somebody had been lying there. Opening the bed, she smelt the smell of a carcass somewhere dead. Then, upon the cloth tester, she perceived something rolling from side to side. By and by, being forced out of her bed and not time to dress herself, with such cries and other things almost amazing her, she with two maids got upon their knees by the bedside to pray. Still the specter assaulted them. Oftentimes she would be lifted a foot or more high from the ground by an unseen hand. Diverse assaults would be made by fits. It would come with a cold breath of wind. The candles burned blue and almost out. Horrible screechings, yellings, and roarings within and without the house. Sad smells of brimstone and powder. And this continued from some nine at night to three the next morning, so that the poor gentlewoman and her servants were in a sad case the next morning smelling of brimstone and powder, and, as I remember, all black with it. This continued so violent that the gentlewoman was fain to withdraw to her mother's house. 
But her husband's coming home some four months since. We have heard nothing of trouble to the house since. These are the chief things which I dare recommend upon credit, and I could wish that they who questioned the existence of spirits had been but one night in Lanolin to receive satisfaction to their objections. In the year 1679, the house of William Morse in Newbury in New England was strangely disquieted by a demon. On December 3rd in the nighttime, he and his wife heard a noise upon the roof of the house, as if sticks and stones had been thrown against it with great violence, whereupon he rose from his bed, but could see nothing. Locking the doors fast, he returned to bed again. About midnight, they heard a hog making a great noise in the house, so that the man rose again and found a great hog in the house, the door being shut, but upon the opening of the door, it ran out. On December 8th in the morning, there were five great stones and bricks by an invisible hand thrown in at the west end of the house. While the man's wife was making the bed, the bedstead was lifted up from the floor and the bedstaff flung out of the window and a cat was hurled at her. Also, a long staff danced up and down the chimney and sundry things were thrown in through the window. People were sometimes barricaded out of doors when as yet there was nobody to do it. And a chest was removed from place to place with no hand touching it. But the greatest part of the devil's feats were his mischievous ones, and therein the chief sufferers were William Morse and his wife and his grandson. One night they could not eat their suppers quietly, but had the ashes on the hearth before their eyes thrown in their victuals, yea, and upon their heads and clothes, insomuch as they were forced up into their chamber. And as yet they had no rest there, for one of the man's shoes being left below, it was filled with ashes and coals and thrown up after them. On the next night, as they were going to bed, when the man was in bed, he was beaten with a heavy pair of leather breeches, pulled by the hair of his hair and beard, and pinched and scratched. The boy was, was violently thrown to and thro fro. They carried him to the house of a doctor in the town, and there he was free from disturbances. But returning home at night, his former trouble began. All this, while the devil did not appear in any visible shape. Neither were there many words spoken by Satan all this time. Only once, having put out their light, they heard a scraping on the boards, and then a piping and a drumming upon them which was followed with a voice singing, Revenge, revenge, sweet is revenge. And they, be, they being well terrified with it, called upon God. Suddenly with a mournful note, there were six times over uttered such expressions as, Alas, alas, me knock no more. And now all ceased. The true reason of these strange disturbances is as yet not known. Though some did suspect Morse's wife to be guilty of witchcraft. One of the neighbors took apples which were brought out of that house and put them into her fire, upon which they say their houses were much disturbed. Another of the neighbors caused a horseshoe to be nailed before the doors, and as long as it remained so, they could not persuade her to go into the house. But when the horseshoe was gone, she presently visited them. Others were apt to think that a sailor, by some suspected to be a conjurer, set the devil to work thus against the Morse's family. Or it may be some other thing as yet kept hidden by the secrets of providence. By the middle of the 18th century, an era of reason and enlightenment, people still believed in ghosts, but it was often considered a little old-fashioned. 
at the time of the American Revolution, those stories that were published often enlisted supernatural powers in the political struggle against Great Britain. The people in New England generally believed in hobgoblins and spirits at that time. That is, the children at least did. I was a boy at school when the troubles began in Boston, and I recall very well the superstitious stories which were being circulated about at the time. People were certain that a war was about to take place, for a great blazing comet appeared, and armies of soldiery were seen battling in the clouds overhead. It was said that the day of judgment was upon us when the moon would turn to blood and the world be set on fire. These dismal stories were so often repeated that the boys thought nothing of them, that these events must happen in the natural course of time. But for myself, I earnestly wished that the church which stood beside my father's garden would topple over and crush me to death before these things happened, and thus put me out of my pain quickly. Now in the first print, I showed Christopher Sire, the martyr, grasping at his wound, trying to stop the flow of blood, while his friends weeped by his side. I showed a monument. In his honor, a bust of the boy and a plaque honoring the five that were slain on King Street on March 5th, and a warning of revenge. In the second window, perhaps you've heard of my famous print, which I borrowed from an artist named Henry Pellow, showing the soldiers firing upon the inhabitants, blood flowing in the streets, dead on the ground, the wounded falling. And in the next window, I showed a lady representing America, sitting upon a tree stump, staff in hand, with a liberty cap placed upon it, and on, under her foot, a British grenadier, he grasping at serpents, while she pointed at the massacre on King Street. The bells tolled again that night, at nine o'clock for an hour, and I took down my display. But the next day, in the newspaper of Mr. Eads and Mr. Gill, the Gazette, were lines which we should remember in the name of justice. Cider's pale ghost, fresh bleeding stands, and vengeance for his death demands. The wonderful appearance of an angel, devil, and ghost to a gentleman in the town of Boston, printed and sold by John Boyle in Marlborough Street in the year 1774. Our preface. We, the subscribers, do testify and declare that in the morning of the 17th day of October, 1774, we received each of us a card from a certain gentleman in this town desiring our attendance at his lodgings at 10 o'clock that morning. Agreeable to his request, we waited upon him where he told us what had happened to him, an account of which follows. Night the 1st, October 14th. After supping amongst a select company of my acquaintances, I returned to my lodgings. Being sleepy, I went upstairs in order to get to bed. But before I had finished undressing, 
I heard the most melodic yet unearthly noise just outside the house. I opened the window to look around in hopes of discovering the source, but all looked serene and not one thing amiss. At last, after some ten minutes, the noise quieted down and then ceased altogether. I finished undressing and climbed into bed, though was unable to sleep. Then, as the clock struck two, I was startled to hear a violent rapping upon the window beside the bed, and the noise again started, only this time much nearer. Suddenly, the window shutter, which was on the inside, flew open, and a light burst into the chamber that far exceeded that of the sun. At that moment, an angel appeared. In one hand, he, he held a sword, and in the other, a pair of scales. Immediately I asked him, my voice trembling, Friend, from whence came you? What business do you have with me? The angel did not immediately reply, but sat himself down on a chair. He then said, Arise, man, from your bed, and take a chair and sit down by me. I have something to communicate that is of the greatest importance. Your temporal and eternal welfare are interested in it. I did as commanded, and the angel continued. I descended from my celestial abode to acquaint you and all those of your caste that heaven beholds such miscreants with contempt. And unless you speedily repent and make restitution to your countrymen, you may justly expect the hottest place in hell will be reserved for you and all such traitors to their king and country. But I am not here to discuss the particulars of your crimes. I have come only as a harbinger of one far more terrifying than I, who is to pay you a visit tomorrow night. With that, he dissolved, and with him, the brilliant light. All was quiet and dark in my chamber again. I then collapsed upon the bed and amazed until morning. I spent the next day in the greatest of agitation. Hours passed and the sun went down. I stayed up until nearly midnight, then reluctantly ascended to my chamber and got into bed. Night the 2nd, October 15th. At half past 12, a gust of wind extinguished my candle, followed by a terrible shouting and shrieking. The door of my chamber flew open, and there in the doorway appeared the most frightful form my eyes ever beheld. I knew instantly the figure was the devil himself. In his right hand he held a book, and in his left a halter. These awful figure then entered my chamber, sat down, and addressed me. I have come from the infernal regions with speed upon a very important errand. I must warn you of the crimes you have committed against your country and the punishment you will most assuredly suffer if you continue as you have. Tell me, how came you to be such an enemy to your country. I, re I replied that I, he is much mistaken, as I have always been a true friend to my country, doing everything in my power to promote its welfare. And the devil said, then please describe your friendship. I am listening. So I explained. About ten years ago, I and others wrote letters to our friends in Parliament desiring them to pass an act whereby the inhabitants of the American colonies would be on equal footing with their brethren in Great Britain. In their wisdom, they passed the Stamp Act. Now, America would help pay the costs of the war against the French. Before then, we were exempted and therefore had grown too rich. Now we would shoulder our part of the public burden, as is expected, of all of His Majesty's subjects. 
But, to my dismay, our people were not happy. They were outraged. Mobs committed acts of violence against the properties of very worthy gentlemen and administrators of His Majesty's government. Parliament attempted other duties, but again violence ensued. At last, Parliament repealed all of the, the duties except that on tea, and as I'm sure your worship, pardon, your majesty is aware, last December the mob dumped the tea into the harbor. Then was my sad country in a state of lawlessness. In order that my countrymen might receive and recover a full sense of their obedience to the king, I and others drafted letters providing Parliament with a true account of what has been happening here. To my complete satisfaction, they responded by closing Boston Harbor. They also sent the army back into Boston to bring peace to this troubled town. They also passed another act for the better regulating of the government of Massachusetts Bay, which would remove the most obnoxious democratic vices from our charter and provide these infatuated multitudes with good and steady government. And so, in this time, I consider it my duty as a patriot to warn my countrymen that by their actions they are bringing down the vengeance of their superiors upon them, and unless they are quiet and submissive, they must respect and expect the severest punishment in this world and damnation in the next. The devil then replied, Your system of politics will never do. So far from being a friend to your country, I am now convinced that you are one of its greatest enemies. I now tell you, with real regard to your future welfare, that you will be eternally tormented in the hottest place in hell. Repent! Ask forgiveness of all you have injured, and make full restitution, lest I come again and snatch you away into the eternal flame. With that, he vanished. I wanted to tell him that I am resolved to be a better man, but I was deprived of that privilege. Night the Third, October 16th. After two sleepless nights, I expected at last to get some rest, but again I was disappointed. At the stroke of midnight, I awoke. There, standing at the foot of my bed, was a ghost. He wore a long white gown. His face was pale and hollow, and his hair was much disheveled. I lay there some time looking at him in terror and amazement. The ghost did not speak, but stared intensely at me. Summoning my courage, I asked him who he was and from whence he came. Then, with a cold, mournful voice, he said he was one of my venerable ancestors and that he came from the regions of the dead to visit one of his degenerate offspring. The ghost continued, saying, You sprang from a reputable family, some of whom were driven from their native home by persecution to this place. Here they hoped they and their descendants could enjoy that liberty which was denied them. Here we were exposed to savage beasts and a harsh climate. We battled Indians and Frenchmen to secure for our children a peaceful and comfortable existence. We fought and we suffered not for ourselves, but for generations unborn. But now I am disturbed from my rest because I see that you have lent 
a busy hand in bringing New England under submission to tyranny and slavery. You have used the gifts I purchased for you to destroy the happiness of your fellow men. You have, in the name of loyalty and patriotism, profited from their agony. Do you think that heaven will overlook your perfidy, you unhappy man? You will hereafter meet with your just rewards. To this I replied, Venerable Shade, I never, till last night, had the least apprehension that I was doing wrong. I thought I was serving the interests of my country. O oh, guilty mortal, said the ghost, I am sorry you have so long deceived yourself. If you have the least spark of gratitude to the memory of your departed friends and family, repent of your wickedness in the most public way possible. Make restitution and ask God for forgiveness. At last he vanished and I was left alone in my chamber, scarce able to bear up under the weight of my guilt. I am resolved now to change course and to sin no more. The beginning of the 19th century saw pushback against the indulgent ideals of the previous generation. This period gave rise to the American Gothic genre, characterized by the struggle between rational and irrational. This next story, published in 1820, may sound familiar. Along the banks of the mighty Hudson River, in a region the Dutch navigators called the Tappan Zee, where they would prudently shorten sail and pray for the protection of St. Christopher. There is a quiet little valley known as Sleepy Hollow. Sleepy Hollow is one of those places that time seems to have forgotten. And the people who live there, the descendants of the old Dutch settlers, have carried on for generations in much the same way as their ancestors before them. Furthermore, Sleepy Hollow is one of the quietest places on earth. So quiet, in fact, that they say the place is bewitched. That in ancient times the Indians held their rituals there. But whatever the cause, the valley is filled with haunted places. And even the people who live there are given over to all sorts of twilight superstitions. Now chief among the spirits that haunt this valley is the figure of a man on horseback, dressed all in black and riding a great black steed that scours the valley nightly. Now, if you were to encounter this apparition, you would know him immediately, for he is quite conspicuous for his lack of a head. And thus he is known as the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow. Now, the most authentic historians of the region claim that it is the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head was struck off during some battle during the war. For the British and American lines had run very close to that haunted valley back then. And they say that the body of the trooper is buried in the yard of an old abandoned church in the woods, accessible by an old cart road that crosses a brook by a wooden bridge. And that the spirit of the trooper rises from his grave every night and rides forth into the valley of Sleepy Hollow in nightly quest for his missing head. And his rushing speed, like a midnight blast, is owing no doubt that he must return to his grave by the dawn. At the time of our story, the war had been over for some twenty years. And there dwelt in Sleepy Hollow a young gentleman by the name of Ichabod Crane 
He was a native of Connecticut, and being a man of some learning and education, he was called to Sleepy Hollow to serve as school teacher. Now, Ichabod Crane was exceedingly tall and lanky. He had hands that dangled what seemed a mile beyond the cuffs of his coat and feet that could serve as a shovel. He had a large flat head set atop a spindly neck and large gr glassy green eyes and a long snipe nose. Now to see this figure striding along the crest of a hill with his loose garments fluttering behind them in the breeze, you might be thinking that it was the genius of famine itself descended upon the earth. However, being a man of some learning and accomplishment and culture, his appearance at the tea table was always welcome. And Ichabod Crane spent many a pleasant winter evening by a crackling fire, enjoying the comforts of kitchen and cupboard, for the Dutch wives were known for their hospitality and good cooking. However, the conversations would invariably turn to a favorite topic among the people in Sleepy Hollow, ghosts and strange occurrences. Alas, the witching power of the valley had infected even the well-read mind of Ichabod Crane, and he, in turn, would regale his hosts with excerpts of Cotton Mather's history of New England witchcraft, in which he most firmly believed. Now, if these evenings were pleasant enough, they were dearly paid for with the long walk home, where perhaps a snow-shrouded bush would appear as a sheeted specter besetting his path, or the crunch of his own footfalls would make him fearful to turn around, lest he see some uncouth being staring back at him. Or perhaps the breeze among the branches would be the headless horseman himself. But these were mere terrors of the night, easily dispelled with the dawn. And Ichabod Crane would have had quite an easy time of it had he not encountered a young lady. Katrina Van Tassel was the prettiest young lady in all of Sleepy Hollow, renowned not only for her great beauty, but also for her great expectations. She was the only daughter of the very wealthy Baltus Van Tassel, and the young man who could win her heart would stand to inherit a great estate. Now, such a prize would not come without competition, and so it was that poor Ichabod Crane came into rivalry with a roaring young blade named Abraham Van Brunt, or Brom in the local abbreviation. And if Ichabod was exceedingly tall and lank, Brom was known for his great strength and large, powerful frame, and thus he had gained the name of Brom Bones. However, perhaps owing to Ichabod's superior culture, he seemed to be gaining the upper hand. And as Ichabod's suit gained, Brom's seemed to wane, and his horse was seldom more seen at the palings of the Van Tassel mansion. However, Brom was a jealous man. And so things stood for quite some time, when one fine autumnal day, while Ichabod sat in his schoolhouse while his children were conning over their lessons, a servant of the Van Tassels came up and delivered a message. That night, there was to be a quilting frolic at the Van Tassel mansion. Well, whereas everything was all quiet, now everything was all bustle and activity, and Ichabod hurried his students through his lessons and sent them home an hour early. Then he rushed back to his lodgings at the Van Ripper farm. He adjusted his looks in the mirror and donned his best, well, only suit of rusty black. And he borrowed a broken down old farm horse and Hans Van Ripper's best saddle. And thus mounted, like a knight errant off to rescue his fair damsel, he made his way to the estate of the Van Tassels. When he arrived, the scene that was set before him was dazzling, and there was a table set with every kind of delicacy of the Dutch kitchen. Now, I do not have time to describe the scene properly to you, but rest assured, Ichabod Crane sampled each and every dish. And then after dinner, the tuning of a fiddle signaled the time for dancing. And there was Ichabod Crane, turning and bowing and promenading with the lady of his heart. All the while, Brahm sat by, looking on in sullen silence. Well, soon as the evening progressed, the people settled down by the crackling fire, and the old men were there sharing stories. 
but the conversation was anything but comforting. Apparently, the headless horseman had been seen in the valley of late. Now, one old farmer by the name of Brower said that he got up behind the headless horseman just two nights ago, and he chased him over hill and dale, but when they came down the old road to the abandoned church, where the body of the trooper was supposed to be buried, as soon as he came to the bridge that crossed the brook, the headless horseman turned into a skeleton and threw old Brower into the brook and then disappeared in a flash of fire and brimstone. Now, Brom Bones was rather unimpressed, and he said he encountered the horseman the other night and dismissed him as an errant jockey, said he challenged him to a race and a bowl of punch, and said he, I should have won it too, for my horse Daredevil could not be beat by any horse, alive or dead. But, like in Brower's story, when he came to the bridge over the brook, the horseman simply disappeared. Eventually, the evening came to an end, and everybody made their way back to their homes, and their carts could be heard rattling among the hills amidst mingled laughter. Ichabod and Katrina were left alone. And after the uh, custom of the time, Ichabod hoped that night to perhaps seal his victory and ask for Katrina's hand in marriage. I do not pretend to know what happened between them, was perhaps Katrina playing him off and trying to make Brom jealous? We'll never know. But I fear something went terribly wrong, for after a very short time, Ichabod came out of the house and made his way straight to the stable where he roused poor Gunpowder with many an uncourtesy kick and cuff. And then he made his way down through Sleepy Hollow, back to the Van Ripper house. It was the very hour of midnight, and the moon was veiled by the clouds, and there was a slight breeze that made the branches sway and groan. Soon, the thoughts of ghosts and the conversations that had been happening drowned out the memory of his recent heartache, for his road was beset with perils of the invisible world. For not far beyond the Van Tassel mansion, there was a great tulip tree whose boughs reached down nearly to the ground, and it had an evil reputation. For it was upon that tree during the war that Tories and traitors were hanged. And then further beyond that, as he walked with gunpowder, the road crossed a small brook, likewise of evil reputation. For it was at that very tree-shaded spot that the unfortunate British officer, Major Andre, had been captured and later executed. And unhappy was the traveler who had to pass that brook after dark. Thinking to put this peril behind him, Ichabod applied a heel and, and crop to gunpowder to quicken his pace. And as they approached the spot where Major Andre was captured, the perverse old animal stopped dead in his tracks. Ichabod again kicked him and applied the crop, but the animal darted right and then left, but he would not cross the brook. Now this argument went on for seemingly uh, hours. Ichabod's fear was turning into panic, but then, in the shadows of the side of the road, he heard the distinctive sound of a horse's tramp. Ichabod stopped. He looked. It was so dark he could not see. Just perhaps a darker bulk in the moonlight. Who's, who's there? He cried. There was no answer. Who are you? Again, no reply. And there was something appalling in the silence which Ichabod could not quite account for. He again turned his attention to Gunpowder and kicked him and hit him with his crop. And Gunpowder seemingly got over his waywardness and crossed the brook. But as they crossed, Ichabod heard the distinctive plashy tramping of a horse as his midnight companion also crossed the brook. Ichabod was being followed. So Ichabod thought, well, perhaps I'll sing an old psalm tune and put my mind at ease, but 
His voice caught in his throat as his mouth was too dry to make a sound. And then he thought he could perhaps leave this companion behind, and so he quickened his pace. But so did the follower. And then he thought, well, perhaps I can pull off to the side and stop, and whoever it is will pass me by. And so nervously, he rained gunpowder to a halt. But so did the other. Just at that moment, a slight breeze stirred the clouds, and it freed the moon and the stars, and they shone down upon the road, and Ichabod looked behind him, and he saw who was following him. He was a man with a large, powerful frame on a large black horse. And yet, he could see in the moonlight that the silhouette ended abruptly at the shoulders. It was the headless horseman! So Ichabod applied spur to gunpowder and they dashed off down the road, but the horseman was full jump with them as they dashed along and he could almost feel the goblin horse's hot breath on his very neck. And in his panicked flight, he hardly noticed that his saddle had begun to slip and that eventually it fell off and crashed to the ground and was trampled by his pursuer. Ichabod hanged on to gunpowder with all his might and then they came down to a place where the road forked. To the left, the road led to the village and safety, but to the right was the old cart road that led to the abandoned church. Frantically, Ichabod reined and spurred gunpowder to the left, but the animal darted to the right down the old cart road and the horseman still behind him. But not all hope was lost, for Ichabod realized that if he could just make the old bridge across the brook, the horseman, according to the rules, would disappear and he would be safe. So he applied his heels to gunpowder for one last burst of speed, and then presently he was upon the bridge, clattering over the planks. And when he gained the opposite side, he stopped and he looked behind him to see if the ghost had disappeared. He had not. To his horror, he realized that the horseman had raised himself up to his full height, well, almost his full height, and held before him his head. And he hurled the horrible missile straight at Ichabod, and it collided with Ichabod's head with a horrible thud. And Ichabod went down into the ground, and Gunpowder and the Headless Horseman galloped off into the night. The next morning, Gunpowder was seen munching grass back at the Van Ripper farm, without his saddle and without his rider. A search was made throughout Sleepy Hollow, but Ichabod was never found. Down at the brook, they discovered Ichabod's hat, and about it, smashed bits of pumpkin, but no sign of Ichabod Crane, and he was never seen in Sleepy Hollow again. Now, years after, some claim that Ichabod was so frightened that night that he ran all the way back to Connecticut. And whenever the story was told in Sleepy Hollow of Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman, Brom Bones would uh, have a peculiar gleam in his eye, and by his laughter it seemed that he knew more than he was letting on. But there were some who firmly believed that he was, in fact, spirited away by the Headless Horseman and taken back into his grave by the old abandoned church across the brook. Of course, that is the story that some people believe. I, however, don't believe a word of it. As the 19th century progressed, the popular rise of ghost stories had some people concerned. In 1822, an anonymous writer titled only The Egotist published an article in Concord's Middlesex Observer. It stated, It is not of the superstitions of past ages that I am speaking. It now exists among ourselves to a great extent. The seeds of it are sown in childhood and take deep root before a reasoning power is developed. They enter into the elements of our Constitution, mingling in the fountains of thought and thus poisoning the springs of happiness at the source. 
It is then the duty of the parents to guard well the ears of children, and if possible, to never suffer them to hear stories offered to excite terror at supernatural objects. Although the egotist advocated for the eradication of such ghostly folklore, the popularity of those stories persisted. By the mid-19th century, American Gothic gave way to full-blown horror, as authors such as Nathaniel Hawthorne hit their stride. Houses of any antiquity in New England are so invariably possessed with spirits that the matter seems hardly worth alluding to. Our ghost used to heave deep sighs in the particular corner of the parlor, and sometimes rustled paper as if he were turning over a sermon in a long upper entry, where, nevertheless, he was invisible in spite of the bright moonshine that fell through the eastern window. Not improbably, he wished me to edit and publish a selection from a chest full of manuscript discourses that stood in the garret. Once, while Hillard and other friends sat talking with us in the twilight, there came a rustling noise as if a minister's silk gown sweeping through the very midst of the company so closely as almost to brush against the chairs. Still, there was nothing visible. A yet stranger business was that of a ghostly servant maid who used to be heard in the kitchen at deepest midnight grinding coffee, cooking, ironing performing, in short, all kinds of domestic labor. Although no traces of anything accomplished could be detected the next morning, some neglected duty of her servitude, some ill-starched ministerial band, disturbed the poor damsel in her grave and kept her at work without any wages. Young Goodman Brown came forth at sunset into the streets of Salem Village, but put his head back to exchange a parting kiss with his young wife, Faith. And Faith thrust her own pretty head into the street, letting the wind play with the pink ribbons of her hair and cap, while she called to Goodman Brown. Dearest heart, whispered she, pray thee, put off your journey until sunrise, and sleep in your own bed tonight. Pray tarry with me this night, dear husband, of all nights of the year. My love and faith, replied young Goodman Brown, of all nights in the year, this one must I tarry away from thee. My journey must be done twixt now and sunrise. Then God bless you, said Faith, with the pink ribbons, and may you find all well when you come back. So they parted and the young man pursued his way. Poor little Faith, he thought. What a wretch am I to leave her on such an errand. Well, she is a blessed angel on earth, and after this one night I'll cling to her skirts and follow her to heaven. He had taken a dreary road, darkened by all the gloomiest trees in the forest. It was all as lonely as could be. Goodman Brown glanced fearfully around him and thought, what if the devil himself should be at my very elbow? Looking forward again, he beheld the figure of a man in grave and decent attire, seated at the foot of an old tree. He arose at Goodman Brown's approach and walked onward side by side with him. You are late, Goodman Brown, said he. The clock of the Old South was striking as I came through Boston, and that is a full fifteen minutes agone. Faith kept me back a while, replied the young man. The second traveler was about fifty years old, apparently in the same rank of life as Goodman Brown, and bearing a considerable resemblance to him, so that they might have been taken for father and son. And yet, the elder person had an indescribable air of one who knew the world. Most remarkable was his staff, which bore the likeness of a great black snake so curiously wrought that it might almost be seen to twist and wriggle itself like a living serpent. Come, Goodman Brown, cried his fellow traveler. 
This is a dull pace for the beginning of a journey. Take my staff if you are so soon weary. Friend, said the other, exchanging his pace for a full stop. Having kept covenant with by meeting thee here, it is my purpose now to return whence I came. Sayest thou so? replied he. Let us walk on, and if I convince thee not, thou shalt turn back. We are but a little way in the forest yet. Too far, too far, exclaimed the goodman, unconsciously resuming his walk. My father never went into the woods on such an errand, nor his father before him. We have been a race of honest men and good Christians. To this, the elder person replied, I have been well acquainted with your family, as with ever a one among the Puritans, and that's no trifle to say. I helped your grandfather, the constable, when he lashed the Quaker woman so smartly through the streets of Salem, and it was I that brought your father a pitch pine knot kindled at my own hearth to set fire to an Indian village in King Philip's war. They were my good friends, both. I would fain be friends with you for their sake. Indeed, I have a very general acquaintance here in New England. Can this be so? cried Goodman Brown. But were I to go on with thee, how should I meet the eye of that good old man, the minister at Salem Village? The elder traveler burst into a fit of laughter. Oh, well, go on, Goodman Brown, go on, but pray thee don't kill me with laughing. Well then, to end the matter at once, said Goodman Brown, considerably nettled, there is my wife Faith. It would break her dear little heart, and I'd rather break my own. Nay, if that be the case, answered the other, e'en go thy ways, Goodman Brown, I would not for twenty old women like the one hobbling before us there, that faith should come to any harm. As he spoke, he pointed his staff at a female figure on the path, in whom Goodman Brown recognized a very pious and exemplary dame. A marvel, truly, that Goody Clois should be so far in the wilderness at nightfall, he said. But with your leave, friend, I shall take a cut through the woods until we have left her behind. Being a stranger to you, she might ask with whom I was consorting with. Be it so, said the traveler, but take you to the woods and let me keep the path. Accordingly, the young man turned aside but took care to watch his companion, who advanced softly along the road until he had come within a staff's length of the old dame. The traveler put forth his staff and touched her withered neck with what seemed the serpent's tail. The devil! cried the pious old lady. Then Goody Cloyce knows her old friend, observed the traveler. Oh, forsooth, as it is your worship indeed, cried the good old dame. Ye, truly it is, and in the very image of my old gossip Goodman Brown, the grandfather of that silly fellow that now is. But would your worship believe it, my broomstick hath strangely disappeared, and that too, when I was all anointed with wolf's bane, mingled with fine wheat and the fat of a newborn babe, so I made up my mind to foot it, for they tell me there is a nice young man to be taken into communion tonight. But now, your good worship will lend me your arm, and we shall be there in a twinkling. That can hardly be, answered her friend. But here is my staff, if you will. Goody Cloyce then took the staff and sped away. That old woman taught me my catechism, said the young man in stunned horror. The elder traveler smiled, but spoke not. They continued to walk onward. As they went, the elder traveler plucked a branch of maple to serve for a walking stick and began to strip it of the twigs and little boughs which were wet with the evening dew. But the moment his fingers touched them, they withered and dried up. Thus, the pair proceeded at a good pace until suddenly Goodman Brown sat himself down on the stump of a tree and refused to go any further. Friend, he said stubbornly, my mind is made up. Not another step will I budge on this errand. You will think better of this by and by, said his acquaintance composedly. Sit here and rest yourself a while. When you feel like moving again, there is my staff to help you along. 
Without more words, he threw his companion the maple stick and was speedily out of sight. The young man sat a few moments by the roadside, applauding himself greatly and thinking what calm sleep would be his that very night which was to have been spent so wickedly, but purely and sweetly now in the arms of faith. Amidst his pleasant meditations, Goodman Brown heard the tramp of horses along the road and hid himself within the verge of the forest. On came the hoof tramps and the voices of the riders. And though the riders passed within a few yards of the young man's hiding place, he could not see them. It vexed him more because he could have sworn. He recognized the voices of the minister and Deacon Gookin. Of the two, reverend sir, said a voice like the deacon's, I had rather miss an ordination dinner than tonight's meeting. They tell me that there is a goodly young woman to be taken into communion. The hoofs clattered again, and the voices passed on through the forest. Young Goodman Brown caught hold of a tree for support, overburdened with the heavy sickness of his heart. He looked up to the sky, doubting whether there really was a heaven above him. While he still gazed upward to the sky, he lifted his hands to pray. A cloud, though no wind was stirring, hurried across and hid the brightening stars. Aloft in the air, as if from the depths of the cloud came the sound of voices. Once the listener fancied that he could distinguish the voices of his neighbors. There was a voice, however, of a young woman uttering pitiful lamentations. Faith! shouted young Goodman Brown, and a voice of agony and desperation. The cry of grief and rage and terror was yet piercing the night when something fluttered lightly down through the air and the young man seized it and beheld a pink ribbon. My faith is gone, he cried. There is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. Come, devil, to thee is the world given. Men with despair did Goodman Brown grasp his staff and set forth again at such a rate that he seemed to fly along the forest path. On he flew, among the black pines, brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures until he saw a red light before him. It was the hour of midnight. He paused and heard the swell of what seemed to be a hymn rolling solemnly from a distance with the weight of many voices. He stole forward until the light glared full upon his eyes. It, it extremity of an open space arose a rock bearing some natural resemblance either to an altar or a pulpit and surrounded by four blazing pines. As the red light arose and fell, he beheld a numerous congregation. Among them appeared faces that would have been seen on Sabbath looking devoutly heavenward, a good mingled together amongst men and women of spotted reputation. Good old Deacon Gookin had arrived, and the reverend pastor, and Goody Cloyce too. But where is faith? thought Goodman Brown. And as hope came into his heart, he trembled. At the same moment, the fire on the rock shot readily forth, and forming a glowing arch above its base, where now appeared a grave figure not unlike a minister. Bring forth the converts! cried a voice that echoed through the field and rolled into the forest. At the woods, Goodman Brown stepped forth from the shadow of the trees and approached the congregation. The minister and good old Deacon Gookin seized his arms and led him to the blazing rock. Thither came also the slender form of a veiled female led between Goody Cloyce and Martha Carrier, who had received the devil's promise to be queen of hell. Then spoke the dark figure, Welcome, my children, to the communion of your race. Here are all whom ye have reverenced from youth gathered together in my worshiping assembly. This night it shall be granted to you to know their secret deeds. 
How hoary bearded elders of the church have whispered wanton words to the young maids of their households. How many a woman have eager for widow's weeds, have given their husband a drink at bedtime and let him sleep his last sleep in her bosom. How beardless youth have made haste to inherit their father's wealth. And how fair damsels have dug little graves in the garden, and bidden me the sole guest to an infant's funeral. Far more than this, it shall be yours to penetrate in every bosom the deep mystery of sin, the fountain of all wicked arts. And now, my children, thus undeceived, look upon each other. They did so. And by the blaze of the hell-kindled torches, the wretched man beheld his faith, and the wife of her husband trembling before that unhallowed altar. A basin was hollowed naturally in the rock. Did it contain water reddened by the lurid light, or was it blood, or perchance a liquid flame? Herein did the shape of evil dip his hand, and prepare to lay the mark of the baptism upon their foreheads. Faith! Faith! cried her husband. Look up to heaven and resist the wicked one! Whether Faith obeyed, he knew not. Hardly had he spoken when he found himself alone in the darkness without the least trace of the hellish scene he had just witnessed. The next morning, young Goodman Brown came slowly into the streets of Salem Village, staring around him like a bewildered man. The good old minister was taking a walk along the graveyard and bestowing a blessing as he passed on Goodman Brown. He shrank from the venerable saint as if to avoid an anathema. He saw old Deacon Gookin at a domestic worship and thought, what? God doth that man and wizard pray to? And Goody Cloyce, that excellent old Christian, stood in the early sunshine, catechizing a little girl. Goodman Brown snatched away the child as from the grasp of the fiend himself. Turned in a corner by the meeting house, he spied the head of faith with the pink ribbons, gazing anxiously forth. She burst into such joy at the sight of him that she almost kissed her husband before the whole village. But Goodman Brown looked sternly and sadly into her face. He passed on without a greeting. Had Goodman Brown fallen asleep in the forest and only dreamed a wild dream of a witch meeting? If so, it was the dream of an evil omen for young Goodman Brown. A stern, sad, and distrustful man did he become. The horror of that fearful dream tormented him to his grave. So as you can see, the ghost story has a very long history here in New England and still enjoys a great deal of popularity today. This concludes our program for this evening. I would like to thank the Friends of Miniman National Park for their support, our volunteers, and all of you for watching. And as always, have a safe and happy Halloween.